Disclaimer, I've made this video a few days ago and I haven't edited it until yesterday. I was hospitalized due to food poison and I apologize if I might have done anything wrong in this video. Thanks to you Bukon Asia for still giving me the chance to fulfill my dream on being a speaker by doing it virtually. Also, I want to give special thanks to Real Unix and Android Flasher community for helping me on the slides and giving me really great advices. And to my best friend that I will never forget, I will never be like this if you aren't here. Lastly, enjoy the talk. Alright, what's up everyone? Good morning. And well, like, I hope that you guys have a very great day today. And right now I'm going to presentate to you or have give a talk about my experience on turning my unused STB into a mini server with Ubuntu server. So first of all, before I start, I wanted to sort of introduce myself first. So my name is Sama Pratama Chandurdiana, it's a full name, and I'm currently a student at IDN Boarding School and I'm also a founder of the Demivo Security Team, which is a team that focuses on cybersecurity. So, the material that we're going to talk about is that turning your unused TV setup box into a home server with Ubuntu server, of course. So let's go to the first chapter of the talk, shall we? So before we start on executing the materials or experience new stuff, we need to introduce ourselves to the, to the device that we are going to modify. So this is the introduction. What is an STB? A setup box is a device that allows users to view video content from specific internet video provider via the internet. Also known as a setup unit, these boxes convert a digital t television signal to analog to be viewed on a conventional television set or enable cable or satellite television to be viewed. That's according to the Hayvision.com. So actually the main purpose of an STB is that it converts digital signals to analog TVs. But Right now, we're not talking about those kind of STBs right here. We're talking about the smart one that runs under the Android operating system. So it kind of looks like this. I found this image of Google. So kind of different from what I will modify on the day. So it's actually not quite, not too expensive. On my local e-commerce site, an STB, a smart TV box that runs under Android TV, it only costs 199 rupiah or around 18,390 South Korean won. It's actually not too expensive and it's really affordable. Now the pros and cons of using an STB is that the pros way far better quality streaming compared by the antenna, of course. So you know those TV static back in the day? Now by using the STB, it won't really happen that way or it rarely happens. Perhaps if it happens, it doesn't really interrupt the entire signal, maybe just the quality that's destroyed. And the second one is more channels and features available and can be watched by the help of the STBs. So for example, I'm an Indonesian country and I would like to watch the BBC news, which normally by an analog system, I can't really assess that because I'm in an entire different country. Now by using an STB, I can do that by basically, STB has a lot of channels and you can actually add your own playlist, internal STBs, but yeah. And the third one is turning your old TV into a functioning smart TV, running Android OS. Who doesn't love Android, I ask these days? So basically, if you have an old TV and it's barely functioning like how it uh, happens, how it happens in my country where adult TVs are being shut down, so I will I can turn this old TV into a functioning smart TV like those expensive stuff and running Android. Now let's talk about the cons of using an STB. So if your STB comes from a provider like me in the home, a basic, basically a local internet provider in my country, highly cost monthly fees from the cable provider. And it's really that expensive. For us, 200,000 a month for a subscription of a IPTV is really that not friendly for our wallets, for our cash. We can basically uh, use that money to anything else other than what other than watching those channels that we rarely watch like I mean who watch television these days in my country it's rare they rarely do that maybe sir, some people but not everyone really does that 
And the second one, it requires a high-speed internet connection in order to work smoothly. That's why in many STBs, especially smart T smart STBs that runs on under an under Android system, like the STB that I will modify, they require you to connect to a LAN or a local area network instead of a Wi-Fi connection because you understand you and you know that by using LAN or by using LAN or in a local area network directly from the cable to the computer, it will provide you far more better speeds other than by using a Wi-Fi signal, which basically often drop the speed a lot. And the third one is offline authentication server, making it barely usable. So this case happens to me. So basically the STB that I'm planning to modify is the authentication server to in order to STB to work, to get their playlist of the IPTVs, it basically turns offline and is inaccessible, causing the STB to not work properly or can barely usable, to be honest. So every time I try to log in to any username and password, it will just say login fail because the authenticated service is offline and now the STB is basically is nothing right now. And four is loud system configurations plus offline servers. Those two combinations really limit the usage of the STBs if it soon gets suspended. So in my STBs, is that the lock, the system configurations is locked. I can I can really modify it with the usual way. And the offline the server is offline, making it barely usable right now. What shall I do with it? I will. So I just throw it to the trash while well, I just wasted so much money then. Even though it's not used anymore, or if I even try to sell it, it won't really worth that much of money because it's already unusable. So why is it rarely used today? Now every TV that is made as of right now are all supporting digital channels already. So the TV that is sold on the market is now already supporting digital channels and those making it us making us TVs is really unusable basically and causing it to well this sort of mindset actually to be honest I already have a smart TV that's already supported um, digital channels why shall I pay more for an item that basically does the exact same job with my built-in smart TVs making it really unusable to be honest and the second one is most of the old subscription-based STBs servers are down already, leaving the item unusable. So what I already explained to you before, basically the same explanation. And the third one is not to customizable due to the lack of feature and modifications ability. So basically, the reason of it's rarely used today is basically the same thing on why the STBs sucks or the cons of the STBs. So what OS operating system does most STBs runs on? Now I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I'm pretty sure that most STBs, other than Android, they run on Linux. So in this data, I kind of forgot where I got this data from. I got it from my friend. So it runs mostly on Android, which is an extremely good news. Because why? It's so customizable. Originally, Android is so customizable, you can just root the Android, root the system, and do everything you want without any limitation from the built-in company. And even the install custom ROMs that basically locks or uh, reveal all the limits of what your phone actually can do. Because most companies these days provide software update that basically limits your phones on what they can, they could supposed to be doing. Now one of the requirements now one of the requirements to unlock limitations of every Android device is basically as you know by rooting. So chapter B the problem. Also I've kind of forgot to mention to be honest, by rooting a device you also avoid void the device's warranty. So that's why I, I recommend you to root a device if the device is really that old or unusable. Now let's go to the chapter B. Alright, so I apologize for the previous sound quality. We kind of drop a lot, or it's kind of too loud. So now I've tried to make some distance between my, my, my phone and the uh, 
screen, something like that, between my camera, between my phone's microphone, with and my mouth. So I hope it kind of provide best quality, I guess. So let's just continue. So continuing on the chapter B, which is the problems that I face before I try to root or customize the STB. So the only STB in my organization have is this in the home B860H version 5 with a new type of board. So this was actually left unusable because most of our TVs in our school is already digitally or smart TVs running Android as well. So the organization gave me this as TVs which is left unusable. And what I noticed is that what I noticed is that this running a new type of board when I try to unbox it. So as you can see by the STB here, you can see the, H the USB port and the HDMI port. Now the bad news is that we can directly root the device. Now you might ask him, why though? I mean, rooting an Android device is supposed to be easy. You just turn on the developer tools, ADB debugging, and plug it in into a PC and let it all do the work. Now, there's several reasons for that. So the first one is block developer tools. Now I've tried running the developer tools via third party application, but it just says that developer options are not available for this user. And you might say, or you might ask, hey, isn't turning the developer option is possible? If I call the call correctly, you just need to tap on the build number several times and you just become a developer and the developer option is turned on isn't it that easy well not in this case because the stb provider has modified the system or the firmware of this android os so this what happens when i try to unlock the developer tools via the build number Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that I can't install .apk files. It will just show up in the home logo and the SCB crash for some reason. This just happens in my case because I saw most people on YouTube, they could just install the APK directly. So I guess not in this case. And I can apparently connect to the shell terminal of the Android device. Now, as I was saying before, you might be asking, just turn on the developer options. It's really that easy. What's so hard about that? Well, not in this case because when I try to turn on the build number, I mean the developer option by clicking on the build number, it will just ask me to provide a password and there's a QR code and told me to send it to the STB provider so that I could receive the password. Now, I kind of feel lazy enough to just basically scan the QR code and send it to the provider because I believe they won't probably let me either to root the device. So I need to think about another way on how do I root the device. And the built-in firmware is locked totally. I can't modify the firmware because once again, every system customization is locked. Now what's the solutions to this problem that I'm having here? We're going to replace the entire firmware of the STB so that everything is possible. So we could just replace the entire firmware by doing the advanced method here other than the, the basically the, the normal USB to USB, turn on the ADB debugging and boom, that's it. Now, it kind of felt really hard for basically beginners like me, to be honest. So now, let's go to the chapter C of this presentation, is preparation. So, what's up everyone? Again, the chapter C, which is the preparation of what you need to, what you need to prepare to root or customize the firmware of the STBs. So, there are several software that I use to flash custom firmwares, which is ADB Utilities or Terminal, you can use the terminal app for an alternative for that. And the second one was Putty, or basically any SSH uh, client. And the third one is USB burning tool. And the fourth one was MLogic boot card maker. Now that's actually optional because you can just use Rufus or any other things. 
but I'll explain that later. So those are the software that you need to prepare. And there are also several tools that you need to prepare as well. Now, the first one was DSTV, of course. And the second one was a female to female jumper wires. The third one was a USB to TTL. And the fourth one was the USB to USB. And of course, the fifth one was the SD card. It's the SD card. Why shall we need an SD card just to install a server? Now, let me remind you that this STB doesn't really have enough storage to become a server. They often only run on 10 gigabytes of storage or basically, you know those low storage things? Uh, they only provide the storage for the system to work and basically not anything else, making it barely unusable if you use it for something else. So we need an SD card for this, which not only increases the storage, it will also increase the performance. Now, searching for the pre-root firmware, there's a local community in my country, which is Real Unix and Android Flasher, which I found on Telegram. They provide pre-root firmwares and modified firmwares uh, on my on the same brand as mine. Or basically, almost all brands of SCBs, to be honest, are carry AS512 and bht 6 h version 5 Android 10, which is the SCB that I'm running and the Android Flasher. You can just join the group. I'll provide the link above. So you, you guys can take a picture if you are interested to join. Now, just for information that this is an Indonesian speaking group chat. So you apparently need to use either a translator, a Google Translate, or basically any translator tool in order to speak in a group chat. Now, I'm not sure whether if there are someone who able to speak English in the group chat because it's it's so rare to see foreigners foreigners joining on the group. So yeah. Once you found the perfect one, download the modified firmware and because we're going to use this in the USB burning tool. So now let's start flashing. So without further ado, let's just continue to the chapter D, which is the main point of the flashing process. So there's actually multiple ways on to flashing the STBs. So I saw those people on YouTube, they basically just connect the STB with the computer with a USB to USB and boom, it's detected. But for me, because I have a board, a new board, which basically just released in around 2019, basically it's not really that easy since the company has increased the defense or the security of this setup box. So I need to find another way on to flash the firmware. So the step to flash is that the first one, of course, is to unbox the body of the USB so we can access the pins in the internal board. So as I was saying, this is not the easy way and it might be hard for beginners to do. So yeah, we need to play around or mess around with the pins inside the internal board. So, search for the test point for my model. The short point, oh, I mean, second one is the search for the test point. Now, for my model, the short pin point is at the C71A6. You can use a screwdriver, driver, or a needle to short pin the device. Now, how do I know that C71A6 is the pin that I'm searching for? Now, there's actually quite a funny story to that, where basically I just uh, literally, I mess around with the pins, all of the pins, and see which one is the correct one. Because of course, only one of them is the correct one, of, uh, supposedly, I think. So, I try so hard, and I, it got to the point that I was basically stuck in the middle of the process. So, I try asking to the community again, so, on where is the pin for the new board, bro? And they told me that it's C7A6, or something like that they say or something like that which makes me a little bit less confidence to be honest now prepare your USB to TTL and hook clip and search for the hook clip point and check which one is the point of GND TX and RX now once again I get help from the community for this so just like IOTs basically 
like normal IoTs, they have those holes where basically this one is GND and this one is data and this one is TS or, yeah, or RX. So you can get help from the community or find out by yourself by experimenting each hole and yeah, basically like that. Because there's no way that she just asked the company to basically, hey bro, what, just reveal the booklet point. I need to modify this for educational purpose. You can do that, of course. Now, of course, I get help from the community for this. They already experience in that kind of stuff. So those are the holes. Now connect the USB to USB from the SCB to the computer so that we are able to transfer data and transmit commands to the SCB from our computer. Because there's no way that you open up shell commands from the SCB's GUI or screen. They barely, they barely show up anything. Just the boot logo and that's it. Now connect all the hook clip to the desired points and match the female cable to the USB in the USB to TTL as the point details. RX to RX, GND to GND, and TX to TX. So basically just match all of this cable to the point where the USB to TTL is and voila you're done. Now once you're done open both putty and or basically any serial client because we are playing with the USB to TCL here, com ports, something like that. And connect to the serial line and set the speed to 115 and 200. Which that's basically one of the common ports that, I mean speed, that are often used by, I mean, STB providers. If you know what the com, if you don't know what the com port is, or you're confused on which one is the com port, bro, like, I didn't know uh, whether if COM7 is the port. Now, you can do that by going to the device manager and check for ports and COM and LPT. Ports, COM and LPT drop down and you'll see all available ports like below. So you see that the com, it's COM11, COM129, COM161 and basically anything else. So just see it by the device manager. Now once you connect both, power on the STBs and directly sharpen the, com, the points, which is the C71A6. If the putty already serial client, I would put the shell prompt, which in this case was that command G12A U2, U2, U2 12 and VL slash hashtag, means that it's successful. We can just we have access the internal shell of it. So now we need to go into the update mode by typing update, simply update, no need for reboot update because it's not a Adobe prompt shell prompt. And then the USB burning tool will show a device saying that it's connect success. This is good news actually to be honest. Now once the connect is successful, go to file, import image and select the firmware image that you have gotten previously. And this is the important part, uncheck the erase bootloader and then click on start. Now just wait until the process is finished. You can see the flashing output directly by the putty console and the most important part, do not turn off or unplug any cable because it could corrupt the system and things might happen in the wrong way that we didn't want. If you do the step correctly, this will show up. The progress bar turned green and an output burning successfully is showing. Your rooted STB is now ready to use. Now, once everything has been set up, it's time to go to the chapter E. It's basically turning it to a server. So, let me tell you something about Armbian first. So, basically, Armbian is a computing build framework that allows users to create ready to use images with. Cut it first. Check. About Armbian. So,. Armbian is a computing build framework that allows users to create ready-to-use images with working kernels in variable user space configuration for various single board computers. It provides various pre-built images for some supported boards. These are usually Debian or Ubuntu flavor. Now I got the source from the U from the wikipedia.org. So we're going to use Armbian Focal Server here. 
So just for information, the ambient focal is based on Ubuntu Focal 2004, 20.04. .04. You can download the image with the link above, or be, perhaps the media file link is too long. I have already shortened it to a bit.ly bit slash ambient focal image, with A, F, and I being capitalized. So those are the interface of it, how it looks. Welcome to Ubuntu 2008 Bionic with Linux 5.8.6. Let's continue. So let's just go directly on steps to flash the image. Now, to be honest, it's actually kind of fairly simple comparing on routing the SCB itself. Because in this case, we just need to copy the image file and put a bootloader or replace the bootloader of the SCBs to run the server image file. So the first one is to prepare the SD card and its adapter and open up Rubus or other image flashing software. You can use Bologna Etcher or like the previous one that I've mentioned and simply import the image file and select the device. Now make sure this to set the system, the file system, FAT32, partisan seam is MBR, and the target system is BIOS. Now once the little file is flashed, go to the SD card and open the folder ext-linux and open up ext-linux.conf in your text editor. Scroll down and uncomment the second part of slash AML69XXX. So as you can see, uh, from the arrow here, I've already put on the arrow, the red arrow, which basically the rest is being common, so you just need to uncommon this part right here. So that's on how it works. Now eject the SD card from the PC and insert it, insert it to the STBs. Now you see that there's uboot.bin here. So simple, just open up the terminal app or connect to the, to the ADB shell and type the following command in the terminal. So as you can see, su cd sd card slash download dd uh, perhaps I don't want to talk uh, the commands because it probably sound weird. Just for information that those dd and if and off here is basically one command. The slide just messing it up. So this is one command here and once you're done Reboot update. After executing, the STB screen might be frozen or even restarts, meaning that it's booting to the server image file. Now, the chapter F is that how are we going, going to use it? Now, there's a weird thing here. Now that after the reboot, the STB screen will gone completely black, as if it was turned off. Uh, I don't really know what happens. It just happens to my setup box and the only way to use it is to find out the IP address of the STB which will be connected via LAN and connect to it via SSH. We, now how to find the IP address? We can just search the IP via router or IP scanner and search for a device called ARM-64. Strip S64. So as you can see, those are devices that are connected to my Wi-Fi network. And in the bottom one, there is AR ARM64. Now, simply type the IP address of the STB and use port 22. If prompt for a password, use root as the username and the password is either root or root root. Now, for security reasons, you must change those default username and password once you install it. Because we don't want our device to be hacked by hackers outside. So, I think that's pretty much it on today's conference. If you have any questions, um, please ask me directly later on. And I think that's it. Uh, I'm sorry if I speak a lot faster. I've already put the subtitle on this video right here and to, to simplify you on understanding what I'm saying right now. So I hope it's helpful to you guys. If anything is unclear, please ask me because I'm planning to have a question and answer session after this video is played. So that's it for today. Thank you guys for watching and I hope to see you guys soon in the future. Bye.